If you've been on this channel a few years, at least long enough to see any of my videos featuring Ozai, you'll know that I hold him in a higher regard than some others in the fandom. No, I don't think he's a great character. In fact, I think he's perhaps the most vanilla villain in the entire franchise. He might even rank behind Unalak in terms of my general non-interest in him as a character. No, what I'm talking about is his combative viability. Many in the fandom think he is nothing without the use of Sozin's Comet, or that he is without intellect when it comes to fighting, especially when compared to fan favorite Uncle Iroh, who I personally believe will be defeated by Ozai. You can see why by watching this video here. But today, I think it's time to lay out all the evidence in favor of Ozai. By the end of the video, I hope that you will earn at least a morsel of respect for the Fire Lord, especially if you do not hold him in high regard as a combatant. So stick around and let's break this thing down. Hey folks, my name is Antoine Bandelet, your resident geek, giving you theories and discussion for all things Avatar. And today we are going to make sure definitively that Ozai gets his damn respect. And I want my damn respect too. <laughs> A few things before we begin though. First, yes, I say Ozai weird. Sorry, you gotta deal with it. I've had several subscribers and personal friends try to fix my pronunciation, but I literally hear the same thing they say back to me. So yeah, sorry about that. Second, a few years back, I did a geek talk on a versus battle between Ozai and Iroh, and earlier in the year, I made a video detailing why I believe Ozai gets underestimated, which did rather well. You should watch those two videos first if you want to get full context. After doing those two videos, I was made aware of a blog post that went even deeper into Ozai and his power levels within the series, which brings us to three. This video is actually an adaptation of said blog post, which was written by Azronger over on Comic Vine under the title, The Case for Ozai Outside Sozin's Comet. Azronger did give me permission to adapt his blog, and he and I actually produced the video in collaboration with one another. If you've already read his blog post, you won't hear much different here, as I agree with the vast majority of his points. But if you want to see everything highlighted in a neat little video, this is the perfect spot for you. The breakdown of this video will follow the same structure of the blog post, meaning we'll first look at Ozai and his overall power level, then his reputation, followed by his firebending skill, his physical attributes, how certain individuals in the fandom lowball him when debating, and then a final conclusion on how powerful Ozai truly is. Quoting from the blog post directly, Ozai is often seen as unusable in versus discussions outside the parameters of Sozin's Comet because of his dearth of feats. However, the few feats he does possess in base state are of higher caliber in the entire franchise, and he has both in-universe and out-of-universe statements establishing his capabilities further. Moreover, I believe you can reverse engineer many of his showings under the Comet to approximate his unamped skill level. Based on all that information, I will endeavor to construct a serviceable framework around Ozai outside of Sozin's Comet, and then demonstrate how he can be used in versus discussions without too much uncertainty. Now, as I said from the start, I'm already one of those folks who gives Ozai his due credit. However, in the past, I have also said that he should not be used in versus battles because of his narrow showings during the finale of The Last Airbender under Sozin's Comet. So by the end of this video, I might turn around on that idea as well. Only one way to find out. And one last note, again, quote it directly from the blog post. I will be drawing on reference material outside of the mainstream TV shows and comics. This includes, but is not limited to, Avatar Extras and the old Nickelodeon.com databank, which has been preserved on Tumblr, as well as interviews by the creators. For those who object to the legitimacy of non-narrative sources, sources which do not tell the story in themselves, but rather commentate on it from a third-person perspective from outside the fiction itself, I would extend this simple question to you. Why? They were made with the intent of offering real information about the world of Avatar and its characters, so dismissing them seems arbitrary to me. I know some have a strict feats-only policy, but that too makes little sense. Simply because something is not shown firsthand doesn't mean it isn't true or legitimate information. We could debate this all day, but practically speaking, in day-to-day -day life, in order to function, 
every person does trust and even rely on information that they cannot verify with their own eyes. Some examples being what is taught to us in school books, the results of scientific research, what our friends tell us about their lives, and so on. Selectively applying a myopic, I'll believe it when I see it viewpoint to fiction feels very contrived. This point is perhaps where I have the most contention with Asronger, though really not by a lot. I think taking sources from outside the main TV show and comics is fine, and it's really a case-by-case -case sort of thing when it comes to certain feats and accolades given to a character. I'll touch on this more whenever there may be a disconnect, but I wanted to make it more clear that I'm far less steadfast than the author of the blog post when it comes to the use of secondary and tertiary sources. The blog post continues by saying, Some of these detractors decry the few tidbits of outdated information in, for example, Avatar Extras, and use it as a justification for disregarding the entire source. However, such an argument is found on fallacy, specifically the fallacy of composition, wherein one infers that something must be true of the whole from the fact that it is true for a part of the whole. Only a handful of examples serve to demonstrate why that kind of logic leads to inane and blatantly erroneous conclusions. A car's tires are made of rubber, so the entire car must be made of rubber. A contestant wins the race if they run faster, so all contestants win the race if they all run faster. An atom is not alive, so anything made of atoms, like human beings, must not be alive either. And so on. What's more, a few lines in Avatar Extras are wrong, so the entire source must be wrong. Does not hold water whatsoever. Simply put, if one piece of information has been retconned, then only that specific factoid can be disregarded. Everything else remains valid until overridden by a newer source. And it's this last point in particular that I, Antoine, agree with. So long as secondary sources are not overridden by anything else, it's fair game. And on the other side of that token, if it's in the realm of something that's completely unreasonable based on characters and storylines we know, ah, you want to disregard that. But of course, like I said earlier, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Anyway, I think that's enough for this long introduction, but it's very necessary for the types of responses I've received about the Fire Lord. So let's start assessing Ozai. First and foremost, Ozai is the most powerful firebender in the world as of the original series, only surpassed once Aang enters the Avatar state during the final battle. The statements declaring him such come from Avatar extras and thus are exempt from character biases or limited information. It's a bird's eye behind the scenes look at the show, meaning Ozai's accolades are tantamount to scientific fact, or you know, scientific fact in the fiction realm. The official Avatar The Last Airbender YouTube channel also placed Ozai as number one on their list of the strongest firebenders from both the original show as well as The Legend of Korra. While I personally do not take these rankings as factual, as the YouTube channel, the official Avatar The Last Airbender YouTube channel is really run by fans, corporate fans, I would say, people who work for Nickelodeon directly, but they're really fans. They're not really the creators of the show. This isn't like Mike and Brian actually running this actual YouTube channel. You gotta take some of the stuff on that channel with a grain of salt. But still, I felt it worth mentioning for those who put weight on their opinion, although those who do note that they have contradicted themselves before many times, such as with placing Ozai beneath Toph, Katara, and Azula, or having Toph beat Korra in one video but be below her in another, among other silly verdicts, hence the reason why I'm hesitant on giving any credit to that YouTube channel and their ranking system. Ozai's preeminence means he can output more power than any other firebender in the series. This not only includes Zuko and Azula as well as Uncle Iroh, whether you like it or not, but also the likes of Zhang Zhang, who has the single greatest firebending feat in terms of scale. Ozai's firebending also scales over Combustion Man's combustion bending, as the latter is still a subset of firebending rather than an entirely distinct bending discipline of its own. This means that, while Ozai isn't necessarily capable of condensing fire to create explosions with such a concussive force as the Combustion Man, his high-end attacks do contain more energy overall than anything the Combustion Man would be capable of producing. To give an idea, in his debut fight, the Combustion Man's beam stopped Toph and Katara's attacks dead in their tracks and casually blows black solid rock columns into smithereens. In later outings, he showcases similar caliber feats. But most interestingly, Ozai's accolades could also scale him over the dragons as they are technically classified as firebenders. 
We already know dragons had been hunted down since Sozin's time, so it's possible for human firebenders to surpass them. Again, I talk about this in this video here, which you can watch at some point. Ozai, in particular, would be more powerful than Ron and Shaw, individually, not together. Two enormous dragons, far larger than any other we've seen, jointly capable of creating a massive vortex of flame. Here is also a good time to address Ozai's inaugural firebending blast under Sozin's Comet. It is huge, but admittedly not as large as the vortex created by Ron and Shaw the dragons. Given Ozai is amplified during the feat, many assume his base strength caps out far beneath that showing. However, the blast is not allowed to protract to its full length as it hits the ground. The residual fire is dispersed in other directions, so we don't actually know Ozai's maximum scale under the comet, and thus can't constrain his unamped aversion either. What's more, the attack isn't just immense in length, but width, more so than Ron and Shaw's, and it's so focused that the flames are following a straight line down. They are not curving backwards with the movement of the airship like most of the other attacks would, as you can see here with these examples, and generating a force field around themselves. He can theoretically make an even larger blast if he fires looser flames. Not to mention, Ron and Shaw's vortex is a joint feat, whereas Ozai's is done solo, and he sustains it for twice as long as the dragon's. Moreover, in Avatar, concentrated attacks can be more potent than large-scale ones. Aang, in the novelization of the final battle, notes that one of Ozai's quick, regular-sized blasts are more powerful than any attack he delivered prior, including, arguably, his enormous fire plume at the start. And indeed, it is a single, concentrated fireball that breaks through Aang's defenses, whereas a prolonged fire surge fails. Lastly, it's important to examine Ozai's principal feat outside of Sozin's Comet, his lightning generation during the Day of Black Sun. To preface, the potency of lightning is proportional to its charge time, as seen in the Smoke and Shadow graphic novel with Azula, when she fires it instantaneously, it only scorches Kalo's shoulder. When she does it with quick charge time, it is powerful enough to send Zuko flying through the air, although not cause permanent injury. Only with long charge times is Azula able to kill with her lightning, as she did with Avatar Aang and the Catacombs under Ba Sing Se. By comparison, Ozai's lightning against Zuko is generated in just one second, yet has the power to kill your penalty will be far steeper, as he says to Zuko before hitting him with the lightning. And the lightning obliterates the stone stairs leading to the elevated dais. And just the concussive force from the resulting explosion pretty much covers the entire screen and sends Ozai flying feet into the air despite the lightning not hitting him at all. The feat is made all the more incredible by the fact that only the tiniest sliver of the sun, the source of all firebenders power which was just a moment earlier completely blocked, is visible which suggests that Ozai is in fact weakened as firebenders are at their strongest during the day with the sun shining brightly and are less powerful during the night when the sun has set beyond the horizon. The fact that the disempowerment from the eclipse is a gradient rather than a binary on or off switch, a random soldier produces a small puff while the sun is fully covered, also supports this. Zuko later describes the sensation of redirecting it as exhilarating but terrifying, stating that he felt so powerful handling that much energy, indicating Ozai instantly summoned more power than is naturally contained in Zuko's entire chi reserves. The attack also sends Zuko sliding back several feet despite the redirection attempt being successful, whereas with Azula's bolt, Zuko is able to stand his ground suggesting that the gap between Zuko and his father is greater than the gap between him and his sister, which is very important to note because a lot of people will even say that Azula is better than Ozai. I know there is a bunch of fans who believe Azula has surpassed Ozai by smoke and shadow, but this juxtaposition of their respective lightning feats proves otherwise. Ozai's immense power carries over to his reputation. During the show's finale, he is considered the strongest firebender in the world by the masses. This implies Ozai has accomplished things in-universe that are public information and are seen in a better light than any of his other contemporaries' feats. Note that Iroh was thought to have killed the last dragon, which fits with what Brian Konitsko, one of the series creators, has said of Fire Nation culture, and that, quote, it is not uncommon that you will have to fight or duel for political or military positions or purposes, and that, quote, if there's a prince who's 30 years old, he's probably fought pretty intensely a few times in order to, quote, prove his worth, make a name for himself, and to have some fame. 
Therefore, it is not just the accolades from ancillary sources like Avatar Extras that depict Ozai's dominance. It's feats he has accomplished throughout his career that give him credence to his status. Off-screen feats, yes, but feats nonetheless. If he hadn't done anything impressive, he would not be well-known as the best firebender of his time, but he is. For example, let's contrast his reputation with Fire Lord Azulons, who was only considered one of the most powerful firebenders during his time, rather than definitively the strongest like his son. Again, I would like to reiterate my point on the insights from Brian Konitsko, the co-creator of the show. You'll hear many fans say that Ozai did nothing for his station. He held on to power through birth and circumstance alone, not on his own merit. But according to this interview, that is not the case. Ozai is not like some kind of palace dweller, we will say that. I'm not sure how much he's ventured out into the world, but he's not like the Earth King where he's isolated. The Fire Nation is a little more hands-on. It's not uncommon that you will have to fight or duel for political or military positions or purpose. Look no further than Zuko and Zhao's fight in the early episodes of the entire series. There's a big difference. I think in the Fire Nation, unlike in Bossing Se, if there's a prince who's 30 years old, he's probably fought pretty intensely a few times, had to prove his worth, not unlike Japanese samurai in their day. They had to make a name for themselves. They had to have some fame. Fire Nation, like a lot of other militaristic cultures throughout history, has warriors who have to prove themselves either through some battle, test of martial skill, or duel. The Fire Nation is a little more aggressive like that. Ozai is not sitting around eating bonbons in the palace. He's working out. Specific examples of Ozai's notoriety include his Agni Kai with Zuko. When Zuko believes he would face the general whom he had contradicted, he proclaims that he is not afraid and accepts the challenge without hesitation. In the arena, he confidently turns to face his opponent, but when he sees his father instead of the general, he immediately prostrates himself before the Fire Lord and begs for mercy. And it's very likely that Zuko has seen his father's power firsthand before their match. But hey, perhaps you don't have as much respect for Zuko and his opinion on his reaction to his father, but I do know someone that most of you guys do respect, Azula. Azula is similarly terrified of Ozai's anger. Her internal monologue from the series finale's novelization reveals she had already resigned herself to being burned like Zuko when the realization of her brief insubordination hits her. In her own words, she admits she can't defeat her father in combat. Cannot defeat her father in combat. L -l -l Let me repeat that. Cannot defeat her father in combat. There is no ambiguity regarding who is the better of the two. It's Ozai. Azula also doesn't think twice about revealing the location of the Fire Lord's bunker to Aang, Toph, and Sokka once the eclipse has begun to recede during the Day of Black Sun, indicating she is confident that all three would lose to Ozai with his firebending restored in spite of having seen the group in action many times before and running away herself. Later, on Ember Island, days before Sozin's comment, even with additional firebending training by Zuko, Sokka states that if Aang were to fight Ozai as he is, he would lose, with Aang assenting. And once the decision is made to confront him anyway, Aang notes how fighting the Fire Lord will be the hardest thing they've ever done. When Aang goes missing near the end of the series, Zuko believes the only other person who can stand up to his father is Iroh. However, when he pitches the idea to his uncle, Iroh shoots it down after brief consideration, stating he does not know if he could defeat Ozai in battle as one of the reasons. And no, it's not just humility. There is genuine doubt in his words. Keep in mind that Iroh knows lightning redirection, yet he still does not see himself as Ozai's better, even though Ozai's most powerful weapon is being neutralized by that ability. So whatever you say about Iroh's power, the man himself seems to believe his lightning and fire together would be insufficient to beat Ozai just with his fire alone. One of the earliest lessons in firebending in the show is Zhang Zhang instructing Aang about discipline one must master themselves before they can master fire. This is exemplified in the exercise of keeping the flame from reaching the edges of the leaf, which Aang ignores in his excitement of trying to bend proper fire, resulting in a powerful but uncontrolled display that ends up burning Katara's hand. Many believe Ozai falls into this same camp of unrelenting power but absolutely no control, that he is closer to Zhao in temperament than he is to Uncle Iroh. This is, plainly speaking, inaccurate. Ozai's very first feat of firebending in the entire show is enough to disprove this idea, but it is ironically almost always overlooked, giving Zuko his scar. 
Now, I did an entire video about this, which you can watch here, but essentially, as Ronger and this blog post say the same thing that I do, so I'm going to reiterate it here, but really, really clue into this one here. Giving Zuko his scar is an extraordinary feat that people don't give enough credit for. When asked, the co-creator, Brian Konitsko, directly stated that Zuko's vision is not impaired by his scar, only in that he cannot open his eye very wide. This means that Ozai demonstrates enough surgical precision to bring a flame directly over his son's eye without impacting his eyesight, even when the most damage is being done to that region of his skin. The principle of control is seen in further action in Ozai's fight against Aang. Unlike Zuko and Azula, who release attacks of enormous size one after the other, Ozai is shown to favor smaller but concentrated blasts. Aang notes that one of his regular sized blasts on his rock shell is more powerful than any of his prior ones, despite them being far bigger. It's his plasma ball slash firecracker, which is tiny in size, that proves to be his most devastating move as it's able to shatter the earth ball where the others failed. And a tremendous quantity of fire is contained in just the palm of his hand when Aang knocks it away. These condensed attacks show Ozai is more efficient with his power allocation than Zuko and even Azula. This is the mark of a practiced fighter who knows exactly and where to direct his strength, not a savage brute who would accidentally burn his own ships. Ozai is also a master of lightning bending, a subset of firebending that explicitly requires a calm mind, according to Iroh. Ozai is so proficient with the ability that he is able to generate not one, but two charges of lightning simultaneously, one in each hand instead of just one. And again, if you want to bring up Azula in the comic books, not even she is able to do this. As lightning is created by first separating positive and negative energy in the user's body into distinct pulls, with their collision back together, releasing the bolt itself, for Ozai to create two lightning bolts and release them from different parts of his body would require him to divide his energy into four pulls instead of just the usual two. This denotes unparalleled control over his own chi, exceeding both Azula and Iroh's by on-screen evidence since neither has ever been credited with dual lightning. His skill in lightning bending can be extrapolated to regular fire bending, since lightning is merely a purified fire rather than its own element. And the power in both comes from chi energy in the body that is generated via breathing. Ozai's unequal attunement to and control over his inner chi therefore logically translate to unequal control over fire itself. Not just sheer power, but the expertise to manipulate flames in more complicated ways than standard fireballs. And let's not forget what Iroh himself said about generating lightning. Lightning is a pure expression of firebending without aggression. It is not fueled by rage or emotion the way other firebending is. Some call lightning the cold-blooded fire. It is precise and deadly like Azula. To perform the technique requires peace of mind. Ozai takes his chi control even further in his battle with Aang. In the midst of charging another blast of double lightning, he activates, deactivates, reactivates, and again deactivates his fire jets with his feet effectively. He bends fire and lightning from multiple limbs simultaneously. And to clarify, Sozin's comment only amplifies the magnitude of one's bending. All descriptions of its effects are of increased destructive potency, and nowhere is it said to impart additional skill or enhance any other attributes. Therefore, everything Ozai does in terms of skill and technique is something he can replicate under ordinary circumstances. Bending lightning and fire at the same time is something only Azula has been shown to do in cover art for Smoke and Shadow, but never actually in the pages of the story of Smoke and Shadow. So again, really, this can only really, really be attributed to Ozai. And of course, I should reiterate that in that cover, she only shoots one bolt of lightning from her hand while holding a fireball in the other. Double lightning is exclusive to Ozai in the entire franchise, period. We're talking about Rise of the Kyoshi, Dawn of Yangchen, The Legend of Korra, the last airbender, Ozai, is the only one. During Sozin's comment, all the acrobatics Ozai performs and the control over his own body and flames he exhibits are likewise reflections of his innate skill. If for no other reason that he's simply too good at doing what he does for all of it to just be improvisation of a novice without any prior experience, like some fans try to make him out to be. 
He's flying around with impeccable control, almost constantly in motion, precisely using one foot at a time to direct his momentum, outputting the right amount of firepower to stay suspended in the air at the right altitude, even as he's twisting his body in complex maneuvers, dodging projectiles and stone pillars and relentlessly pursuing Aang, one of the most evasive and agile combatants in the franchise. He wasn't called Twinkle Toes for nothing. And Ozai did this while harassing him with fire blasts that almost never missed their target. Typically, if Ozai was really the way that fans try to make him out to be as being this novice, this guy who has no skill, he's just all brains and brawn, he would not be able to control the immense power that is Sozin's Comet into these concentrated, very particular feats of skill. There indeed is precedent for less powerful firebenders being able to fly without the comet. Rangi from the Kyoshi novels uses fire jets to leap between rooftops, Azula to fly over gondolas, and Iroh II to keep up with the biplanes mid-flight and land on top of them. So it is not without reason that Ozai knows how to use fire jets outside of Sozin's Comet. And in fact, I would say it's actually a better feat that he does do it within Sozin's Comet because he's able to concentrate that very, very huge power into these minute, small cases of firebending. At the very least, he has to have the pre-existing skill to accommodate his enhanced firebending to enable everything he does during the comment regardless. It's somewhat analogous to Zaheer, who became one of the best benders on the planet in just a few weeks, solely thanks to his prior familiarity with the air nomad culture and martial arts. Or Unalak, whose showings as the Dark Avatar are still mostly unusable in his normal state because he only gained a boost in power, not skill. The same principle applies to Ozai. He is extremely powerful and extremely skilled, being the only firebender to apply jets in more advanced ways than simply getting from point A to point B, or to hover in place. And one of Ozai's feats under Sozin's Comet that should carry over to his base iteration is his ability to sense chi energy. Given that that arc is one of the delicacies and not directly contingent on power level, fire itself is just a physical manifestation of one's inner chi. It is the only element summoned from the user's internal energy rather than being sourced from the environment. It's only logical then that certain firebenders would have developed the skill to sense their energy in living beings. For example, the Bonti tribe uses firebending in spiritual rites, such as to detect dark infections and Karuk and Korra's souls. Ron and Shaw are also able to sense another's intentions and even their ancestry. And Ozai too is able to sense both Aang's strength and his emotional state in the middle of their crazy struggle, demonstrating keen awareness of other people's chi and denoting that his grasp on the element of fire is far more complete than many give him credit for. Despite being the head of a militant nation that has largely distorted firebending into a tool of destruction, he is capable of feats we only have seen from a specialized tribe of spiritual sages and masters of the true way of firebending despite not being an adherent himself. Plus, his internal prose from the novelization of the finale may not be the first time we've seen this power from the Fire Lord. A far more impressive showcase of chi sensing from Ozai, though, is his feat during the day of Black Sun. Despite firebending being diminished due to a solar eclipse covering the sun, Ozai conveniently knows exactly how long to stall for his conversation with Zuko, and ends his monologue with a threat just a second before the moon begins to recede shooting lightning that very instant. Oh, and note that he is underground. There's no way he can actually see the sun. He feels the sun. Conversely, Azula looks in the direction of where the explosion from her father's lightning is heard and exclaims, oh, sounds like fire bending's back on, insinuating that she merely heard the lightning explosion and deduced her abilities had returned, unlike her father, who can intuitively sense not only when his fire bending had returned, but could outright track the progress of the eclipse in a powerless state. This shows Ozai is much more attuned to the element of fire than his daughter is. He can intimately feel its power in his soul, whereas Azula needs to pick up on external cues to detect it. Some have argued that Uncle Iroh sensing an oncoming lightning strike in the storm rivals this, but I would argue that Ozai's feat is greater given his compromise abilities. And plus, Iroh should not be that far behind Ozai, obviously. However, the Fire Lord's connection to fire by feats is unmatched in the entire franchise. As seen when he is shirtless, Ozai is clearly in excellent shape. 
rocking a lean physique and defined abs. As per the creators of the show, he is not merely an armchair ruler eating bonbons in the palace, he's actually working out, which is briefly depicted in the search comic on one page. Ozai's developed martial skill should be quite high, although it is difficult to divorce his pure hand-to-hand -hand expertise from his fire-bending talent as the two are intertwined. However, as I've shown earlier, based on what he shows during Sosin's comment with regards to his acrobatics and control over his own body, as well as his fearsome reputation and past victories in Agni Kai's, it's not difficult to believe he would be among the highest in the franchise. His father, Azulon, demanded perfection, just like Ozai demanded of Azula, and Iroh, who wanted nothing more than to please his father in his youth, stated his brother's competitive nature went beyond his own. The closest we come to see Ozai fighting without firebending is during the Day of Black Sun, when he takes steps towards Zuko, threatening to kill him with his bare hands, only backing down once Zuko draws his sword. Even then, it's possible Ozai could have defeated his son while unarmed, or very likely at least that he would hold his own as he attempts to goad Zuko into killing him as he's without his bending, which is suspiciously out of character. Ozai visibly cowers and averts gaze when the Avatar State is about to strike him down, so he's very much afraid to die. The fact that he shows no concern over his life while without weapons when facing Zuko, a swordsman trained by Piandao himself, implies that the Fire Lord doesn't believe himself to be at that great of a risk, at least being capable of fending off his son until the eclipse is over. In terms of concrete physical feats, we have to turn to Sozin's Comet. Remember, the Comet only enhances firebending potency. Everything else Ozai showcases is directly applicable to his base iteration. In terms of endurance, he emits a continuous stream of fire that scorches Wulong Forest for 40 seconds and fights Aang almost immediately afterwards for over 7 minutes uninterrupted, almost constantly in the air with fire jets. He's expending his stamina non-stop for longer than any other character in any other fight, yet he doesn't show any signs of fatigue until after the battle is over, and even that is arguably just the result of his clash of spirits with Aang, which the latter notes to be extremely draining and leaves him barely able to stand in the novelization. All in all, Ozai is an endless fuel tank who can fight for just about as long as any battle is realistically going to last. Ozai's durability is quite possibly the highest in the franchise as well. In his battle with Aang, an air blast from the Avatar State sends him flying against a pillar at high velocity while bumping against the ground repeatedly, yet he recovers almost immediately. A normal human would have had every bone in their body pulverized from something like that. Now of course, there are characters in the Avatar universe who seem to be above human levels, they get thrown around all the time, but this one in particular, getting hit by the Avatar State and then surviving is a pretty significant feat. And then on top of that, Ozai is hit full on by a water blast from the Avatar State and falls down dozens and dozens of feet, yet again gets on his feet and continues fighting in a matter of seconds. Lastly, an air blast powerful enough to literally erode stone smacks him against a rock column with full force, yet he seems unscathed. A regular person would have been liquefied instantly. I would say even most of the characters in Avatar who have shown to be above human levels would also be pretty damaged by that. This last feat in particular is so insane I cannot think of anything remotely comparable from another character in Avatar. At the very least, it proves Ozai is nearly impossible to kill or beat into submission without blunt force. Quite a few people have put Ozai down as unskilled for not responding to Zuko's lightning redirection in time and getting flung back. However, a far more straightforward explanation is that he simply did not expect Zuko to perform a technique that didn't exist until Iroh invented it in his travels away from the Fire Nation. Ozai could not have known it was even possible, especially by his son whom he had a very low opinion of. When his lightning is redirected again, this time by Aang, the primary reason he has that dumbfounded expression is because he didn't expect Aang to be capable of withstanding specifically his Comet Enhanced Lightning as revealed in the novelization. Also, and this is me talking Antoine, this is not me quoting from the blog right now, I personally believe that lightning redirection is actually a, of course not, a, not an easy feat, right? Like you're, you're dealing with some dangerous stuff there. but. The fact that you are redirecting it rather than actually controlling it, you're just hosting it in your body for a minute and then letting it go back out. I believe that it's actually easier to redirect lightning than it is to generate lightning. That's not really backed up by anything in the lore. That's just the way that I've always read it in the series. Uh, there's been no like, you know, speech from Iroh or Aang or some novelization or some comic or whatever, but it always made sense to me that 
redirecting lightning is easier than generating lightning. So um, the feats that you see having for Zuko and Aang feel like it's just, it's that's just the nature of the ability is that you can redirect easily. But going back to the blog, it reads, his mind had already registered and processed that Aang was attempting to do before the avatar even pointed his finger at him, which is split second timing. But he doesn't move because he didn't fathom the possibility that Aang could be successful. It's not that he's literally too inept to move or dodge lightning, he's just so surprised he's momentarily immobilized. It's just drama, <laughs> like it's just the drama of the scene, it's nothing more than that. The exact same thing happens to Zuko when Azula redirects his lightning. He's been successful at redirection every other time, but fails only when he doesn't expect the other party to send it back at him. Of course, this happens in the Smoke and Shadow graphic novel. Iroh too has fallen victim to a surprise attack from Azula, but it would be asinine to label him or Zuko unskilled for that, just like in Ozai's case. Basically, just, you know, come with the same energy that you always come for these characters. If you're gonna come after Ozai, then you're gonna have to come after Zuko, you're gonna have to come after Azula, you're gonna have to come after Iroh. You just have the same energy if you're gonna be doing that. If Ozai was to be faced with lightning redirection again, he would not be unaware of the technique's existence and thus not be surprised as he was against Zuko, nor would he have had the arrogance he did against Aang since his powers wouldn't be heightened by Sozin's comet. And he has the mental processing speed to realize what his opponent is doing and get out of the way before the bolt hits him back. Then consider Ozai's superbly sharp reflexes. While flying at immense speeds that would compromise his reaction time, he instantly reacts to two rock pillars being smashed together by the avatar stage in front of him by deactivating his jets and reactivating them faster than gravity can affect him. The fact that several characters who are slower than Ozai, especially when his mobility is augmented by jets, such as Mei, Katara, and Amon, have been able to dodge lightning without any bending at all. And the fact that the vast majority of firebenders aren't powerful enough to contain Ozai's energy without substantial difficulty. See the time of the day of Black Sun when Zuko was sliding back several meters. It should become very apparent that he is far from helpless against the technique and would be able to manage it quite effectively. Lastly, if lightning redirection were an automatic win, Iroh would not have doubted his ability to end his brother. Next, several people have used Iroh destroying the wall of Ba Sing Se as evidence of his alleged superiority to Ozai, citing it as a superior feat to burning Wulong Forest. This comparison is faulty for a few reasons. Firstly, power in firebending comes from the breath, and Iroh deeply breathes in and out a total of six times before gathering the fire around him in an orb that he launches at the wall. Conversely, Ozai only deeply inhales once and then immediately generates a tiny condensed flame that expands into a massive pyramid of fire. Secondly, Ozai is able to sustain his attack for 40 seconds with just regular breathing seemingly effortlessly and presumably planned to for much longer had Aang not interrupted him, whereas Iroh's attack is released once and that's it, in spite of its longer buildup. While I acknowledge destroying a thick stone wall takes more energy than burning trees, that at best makes this comparison ambiguous and inconclusive, at worst, it clearly favors Ozai. In any case, I merely address it to show it can't be used to place him below Iroh. Lastly, Ozai taking a long time to burn through Aang's earth shell is not a black mark against him either. To preface, earthbenders have the capability to manipulate earth's molecular composition to harden or soften it, as demonstrated by Haru and Tyra when they fuse multiple small pieces of coal into a larger boulder. Toph, when she binds individual grains of sand together to create a platform of solid rock, and Bumi, when he makes his stone projectiles harder than metal. The entire principle behind lava bending is exciting the atoms in the earth enough to liquefy it, and the reverse is also possible shown by Bolin. Thus, the reason behind Ozai's ability to immediately melt Aang's shell is likely Aang keeping it intact with earthbending. Earlier in the fight, Ozai superheats rock in mere seconds, showing he's clearly not incapable of it in a vacuum. His stepdaughter Ki even melts through a metal door on her first time firebending as a child, and nobody would seriously suggest that she's more powerful than Ozai under Sosin's comment. Anyone who does is either trolling or acting in bad faith, and therefore not worth replying to. And all in all, it's actually a good feat for Aang, rather than a poor one for Ozai, as Aang's queuing up his defenses very well. Ozai often gets downplayed because people think he lacks concrete showings outside of Sozin's Comet, but there are dozens of data points which can be used to paint a picture of his unamped abilities. Firstly, no firebender in existence can match his sheer power, so a victory over him would have to come by way of skill. 
Problem is, is that Ozai is so skilled himself that he can already perfectly execute all that he does during Sozin's Comet and outside of Sozin's Comet in terms of his technique. And to perform flight to that degree is merely a matter of enhancing the potency of firebending. His unparalleled control over chi energy, the source of firebending within a person, as evidenced by his dual lightning generation, also denotes an unparalleled control over fire itself. Because of his skill, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to get a hit on him, even if it does happen. If attacks that can literally erode stone aren't going to put him down, then what is? His stamina also guarantees that any bender facing him would either have to be able to keep up with his onslaught for at least 10 minutes before he begins to exhaust himself, or be skilled enough to land multiple consecutive building busting attacks on him to wear him down, which he would never let happen to him due to his own mobility. Overall, Ozai is one of the most formidable benders ever. Arguably the strongest bender in the entire franchise besides bloodbenders, avatars, and certain high tier spirits. Besides his only weakness being lightning redirection, which he can definitely evade, he truly has every base covered. And myself and Azrogger can only hope that we've done an adequate job at conveying that. And that's it! This video will likely stir a bunch of debate and I'm here for it. In fact, share this out with your avatar friends and let's get this discussion going. Do you agree that Ozai is insanely underrated and downplayed? Or do you believe he's just a sham and a worthless firebender? Let me know in the comments below and I'll catch you on the next one. And as always, peace, love, and remember, be water my friends.